Hi, and welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the Tudor 4 player Fire and Stone, designed by Klaus Jurgen Vreda and published by Pegasus Spiele, who helped sponsor this video. Your tribe is looking for new homes, and in the Stone Age, this means you'll be exploring new lands while hunting and gathering to survive, and perhaps coming up with a few inventions to make your life easier. Other tribes are hoping to make their mark on the world, but so are you. So join me at the table and let's learn how to play. To set up, place the game board in the middle of the play area. It's divided into three regions separated by these dark lines here and here. All of this area is known as region one. Everything in this area is region two, leaving everything here as region three. And as you can see, each region is divided into several smaller spaces. The tokens in this shape are the discovery tiles, and you should flip them so that the side showing a numeral is face up. Then sort them into three groups of matching numbers, giving each group a good mix. On many spaces of the board, you'll find what is known as the food symbol, and you'll now cover each of these with a discovery tile matching the value of that region. So here, in region one, we would place all of these numeral one tokens. In region two, we place these tokens, and in region three, we'd place these. When you're finished placing all of the discovery tiles, it will look like this, leaving just the spaces with this fire symbol empty. These are the animal tiles, which you'll flip so that this side is face up. Then mix and set a stack of three of these tokens on each of these spaces of this track so it looks like this when you're done. The cards with this back make up the cave deck, and normally you would shuffle all of these together, but for your first game they recommend only using the ones with the blue symbol in the corner here. You now give these a good shuffle and deal one unseen face down into the space for it here, returning all the other cave cards unseen back to the box. Next we have the invention cards with this back which you shuffle into a face down deck near the board, dealing three of them into a row face up. The game also comes with starting inventions showing this back, but leave them in the box for your first game and we'll discuss these later. These are the victory point cards, which you'll sort by their different values, stacking all of the ones on the bottom, the twos go next on top, and then the threes on top of that. Beside the board, now place these food tokens, bag tiles, and this game end card. I have mine in a game tray that I have, and if you'd like some for yourself, you'll find links in the description. Now each player takes a tribe mat and double-sided player reference, along with one placement card, 20 huts, one marking stone, two gathering tiles, and three scouts in their chosen color. Now each player sets one of their scouts onto the matching space of this area here, with another set onto the zero space of this victory point track. Their final scout they now set into this space of South Africa showing these scout symbols. On your tribe mat, you set your two starting gathering tiles on either of these bottom spaces. On the other hand, if you only have two players, you won't use these at all and you return them to the box. If you have only three players, as we'll have in this video, flip these over and then have players pick one of these symbols for all of them to return to the box, and the other each player will set into one of these bottom spaces. Now find and shuffle the task cards which have this back, dealing one to each player. Look at your own task, but keep it a secret from the other players, setting it face down on your placement card into the space for it here, with your marking stone placed above it. We'll learn more about the task cards later, but you can always examine yours privately anytime you like during the game. And finally, randomly pick a player who will take the first turn. And that's the setup. In Fire and Stone, you and the other players will spread out across the globe, hunting and gathering food, developing new inventions, and building huts for your growing population, all in an effort to gain the most victory points by the end of the game. The game is played over a series of turns, starting with the first player and going clockwise around and around the table. And on your turn, you'll perform two steps, starting with the move step. Here, you move your scout from the space it's in up to two adjacent spaces away. But you must move at least one space, and your scout cannot end its move on the same space that it started from. That said, any number of scouts can end up sharing the same space over the course of the game. As we mentioned, the board is divided into three regions. 
All scouts start in the first region, and you can't move into any spaces of the second region until it's unlocked, and we'll see how that works later. You'll also notice some spaces are connected by white arrows, but you can only use these arrows once your tribe has invented shipbuilding, which we'll learn about later. Either way, after you've moved your scout, it's time to perform the next step of your turn, the action. And the kind of action you can perform will depend on the space that your scout moved into. If the space has a discovery tile with its numbered side face up, you now flip it over, and it will show a symbol indicating what type of tile it is. For example, this is a forest. Now some tiles have what is known as a discovery effect, and if so, you must immediately resolve it. For example, after revealing a forest, it means that you now collect one of the animal stacks down here from the bracket showing the region that your scout is in. So we take it from here. You then set these face down on the space with the forest tile that you just revealed. Your double-sided player aid will give you a summary of the discovery tiles. Here, we see the forest tile, and this symbol means it has a discovery effect, which will then be shown beside it. After revealing a new tile and resolving any discovery effect it has, you may now perform the main action of the tile itself. For example, the forest's main action is to take all of the animal tiles from that area, look at them privately, pick a single one to keep, and set it face down on this space of your mat. And you can stack any number of these here over the course of the game. The animal tiles that you didn't take, you now put face down back within that forest space. Another scout can then move into this space later, but since this tile has already been revealed, they don't resolve its discovery effect. The discovery effect is only resolved at the moment a tile is first revealed. However, they still get to perform its main action. So in this case, they would take the two remaining tokens, pick one of them to keep adding it to their tribe mat, returning the other one back to its space. Once all of the animal tokens from a forest have been collected, a player visiting this space later won't gain anything. But you still leave this forest token in the space covering the icon showing underneath. So on your turn, you'll move your scout up to two spaces, and then, if there's a face-down tile in the space, you'll flip it over and must resolve any discovery effect it has. Then, you may choose to resolve the main action it provides as well, but you don't have to. If the space you moved into has a tile that's already flipped over, then you may only choose to resolve its main action. As we'll see later, sometimes you'll end your move on a space that doesn't have a token at all, and if so, it may show this food icon. This means you may now choose to gain one food if you'd like. Food is taken from the supply and added to an empty bag space of your tribe map. You start with two bags, so at most you can only hold two food, and if you ever gain more food than you have bags, you just discard that extra food back to the supply. As we'll see later, you can gain more of these bag tokens, which get added to your tribe mat, allowing you to carry more food. Okay, you now know the general rules for a turn. Move a scout, and then resolve the space it ends up in. After that, the next player in clockwise order takes a turn, and around and around the turns will go. However, the forest is only one type of tile you might reveal. So now let's go back to the table and learn the discovery and action effects of all the other types of tiles you might encounter. If the tile that you flip over shows this fire symbol, its discovery effect is that you gain one victory point, which is represented by this symbol. Remember, you'll find the discovery and action effects of each of the tiles here on your player aid. Anytime you gain victory points, advance your marker on the victory point track here. For the fire tile's main action, you may now go through all of the animal tiles stacked on your mat and choose any number of them to prepare over the fire by revealing the chosen tiles one at a time in any order and resolving their effects. Each will provide some amount of bags and or food. When you see the bag symbol, collect a bag tile and add it to your mat. At most, you can have eight bags, so any extra bags you might gain are just ignored. And as mentioned, you can never have more food than the number of bags you currently have. In this case, at most, we can hold three, but we were told to collect four, so the extra one we just don't gain. Since we know our bags would be full after resolving this tile, we probably wouldn't have revealed this one and kept it on our mat for a later visit to a fire. Though any animal tiles you do end up resolving, you just place into a shared face-up discard pile. 
A tile you flip over showing these symbols is known as a secret stash. This gives you one bag and one food as its discovery effect, and then you remove that tile from the board. So this has no ongoing action effect, only a discovery one. Scouts who then move into this space later will instead gain one food. If you flip over a tile with the green background, it's a gathering tile. These come in four different types, and I've laid the other three types out here so you can see them. They don't have a discovery effect, just a main action. After flipping over one of these tiles or entering a space with one that's already face up, you have two options. Either leave the tile in that area and collect two food from the supply, or don't collect any food and take the tile itself. If you take the tile, you must place it on the lowest free space of either of these two gathering tracks. The catch is that each track can only have one type of token in it. So if I'd gathered this type of tile, I couldn't add it to this track because it already has this type in it. So I'd have to put it here. If both tracks already have a type of token in them and you collect a third type, you must pick one of the other columns, discard all of its tokens, and then set the new one in its bottommost space. On the other hand, if you get a token matching ones you already have, you add it to the next space above them. And any time you cover up one of these spaces showing icons, you get to collect either one victory point card or one invention. If you decide to gain an invention, collect any of the face-up ones here, replacing it with a new one from the deck. And if the deck ever runs out, just stop adding new ones to the display. Any inventions you collect are set face up in front of you, and some will have an immediate effect shown here, which you resolve once at the moment you collect it. In this case, it tells us to collect two food. Inventions also give you a new permanent effect. For example, here it says from now on, each time you gain an animal tile, you also collect one food for free. Over the course of the game, you can collect as many inventions as you like, but you may never have more than one copy of each. Once you have this shipbuilding invention, you now treat any spaces connected by these white dashed lines as if they're adjacent, so I can move from here all the way to here. In this video, we're not going to go through each of the different inventions as how they work is described on them, but if you have questions while playing, refer to the included appendix. The effects on your inventions are always available for you to use during your turn, but don't forget, taking an invention was just one of the options you had when covering up one of these spaces. Instead, you might choose to take a victory point card. If so, collect the top one from its deck and place it on the lower part of one of your inventions. So if you don't have an invention, you can't take one of these. Once placed, you lose that invention's effect. And at most, you can only place one victory card on each invention. These victory cards are scored at the end of the game, as we'll see. And also remember, you cannot have more than one of the same invention, even if one of them is covered up. So that covers the effects of gaining a gathering tile. But remember, you can choose to leave it in its space and just take two food instead, which you're reminded of here on your player aid. If the space you move to instead reveals one of these hut tiles as its discovery effect, you must now immediately add one of your huts to this area. As we'll see later, huts usually have a cost to place, but you get to add this for free. When you add your hut, ensure that you cover up this food space to show players that when they move into this space later, they will not be able to gain the food token that's normally showing here. And the hut tile that you revealed you now place into the leftmost empty space of this hut track at the top of the board here. Then you must move your scout from the hut's space to any space in your scout's current region that's showing this fire symbol either permanently printed on the board or on one of the revealed tiles. But after that move, you don't get to resolve the fire action. All of those steps make up the discovery effect of revealing a hut. And since the hut tile itself immediately leaves its space, it doesn't have a main action. However, as you fill up the hut track, new effects may become active. As soon as you place a hut into this third space, players are now allowed to enter spaces of the second region when performing their move actions. A player who adds the fifth hut to this track now collects their scout from here and immediately places it in any fire space of the region their other scout is currently in. Then they immediately perform a move action with this new scout. 
Once they're done, each other player also collects their scout from this track and adds it to a fire space in the same region as their other scout. But they don't get to move and take an action with it. However, from now on, any time a player is taking their turn, they now perform a move and action with each of their scouts. In either order, but they must fully move and resolve one scout before using the other. Going back to the hut track, once the ninth one has been added, all players are now allowed to enter the third region when moving, and if the eleventh hut is added to the track, the end of the game is triggered, which we'll discuss later. So that covers resolving a hut tile. Now let's see what happens if you reveal a cave. There's only one tile like this and it's found in the second region, and once flipped, you reveal this cave card and resolve the discovery effect shown here. In this case, the player gains one food. Now the rules found on the cave card here go into effect and represent the main action you can perform when you enter the cave's space. For example, this one tells us that a player can pay three food to buy the top victory point card, but they may only do this once per game. After performing this action, you add your marking tile here as a reminder that you can't use this effect again. There are a variety of different possible cave effects, and we won't go over all of them in this video, but you can refer to the appendix if you have questions about specific ones. This brings us to the final action you can take when moving into a space building a settlement, and you can only do this if the space you move into has one or more huts already in it, even your own. There is no discovery effect, but as a main action you may pay one food for each hut already there to add another of your huts to that space. So the yellow player, by spending one food, can add one of their huts into this area. Then, after, you must move your scout to a fire space in that region. Now let's say the blue player was to move into this space. If they wanted to add another hut, they would have to spend two food. Just remember, you must always move your scout on a turn. So a scout that starts in a space with a hut, or really any token, can't resolve the main action there because it has to move first. Before moving on, I also want to point out that each region of the board shows a reminder of how many hut and fire tiles it contains. And by looking at the track here, you'll be able to tell how many forest tiles each region will have because there is one tile for each stack. And those are all the ways to resolve spaces you move into, and turns will continue with players moving and taking actions with their scouts until the end of the game is triggered, which can happen in one of two possible ways. As soon as a player adds the 11th hut tile to this track, they finish their turn as usual, and then take this end of game card, setting it in front of themselves with the A side face up. In the rare case that a player adds their last hut to the board before the 11th hut token is placed on the track, that also triggers the end of the game, and instead that player collects this card. Either way, to illustrate what happens next, I've set up our scouts just to show the player order. So here's our blue player. They've collected this card. Now the next player will take their turn, and then the next after. And when it comes back to this player, the very first thing they do is flip this card over, where it reminds us that this player and all the other players will take one last turn. Then when it comes back to this player, they don't take a turn, and instead it's time for players to go to final scoring. First, total all the points showing on any victory point cards you added to your inventions, and advance your marker on the victory point track by that amount. Also gain one point for each of your huts on the board. Then, in each space with huts, check to see who has more of theirs in that area compared to each other player and give them one extra point. For example, here, blue has more huts compared to yellow and more compared to black, so they earn one extra point. If there's a tie within a space for most huts, for example here between blue and yellow, then no one there gains the bonus point. On the other hand, if a space has just huts of a single color, they still count as outnumbering any other color there, and that player gains the bonus. Finally, players reveal the task card they gain during the setup and score any points it provides. For example, this one earns the player one point for every hut majority they have in spaces adjacent to a lake, which are these spots printed on the board. If you have questions about how any of the tasks are scored, you'll find them explained here on the appendix sheet. Now check the final scores and the player with the most points wins. And in the case of a tie, 
the Tide players share the victory. The game also comes with a starting inventions variant where you use as many of these cards as the number of players. So let's say again, we had a three player game. You would just randomly remove one of them and reveal these and have the player last in the turn order pick one of these to take. Then in reverse turn order, each other player takes one that remains. In this way, each player will begin the game with a unique invention. And that's everything you need to know to play Fire and Stone. If you have any questions about anything you saw here, feel free to put them in the comments below and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. You'll also find forums for discussion, pictures, other videos, and lots more over on the games page at BoardGameGeek and I'll put a link to that in the description below. And if you found this video helpful, please consider giving it a like, subscribing, and clicking that little bell icon so you get notification anytime we post a new video. And if you'd like to support us directly, you can join our Patreon team, which I'll have linked below. But until next time, thanks for watching.